first of all, uh, let me introduce ourselves first. So we have Tone Ways and we have the Financial Summit. So the Financial Summit, if you are not aware, is a ga- is an annual event that happened in Abu- uh, that happened in Dubai this year in Rasul Khaima, uh, in a five star resort. And next time we are planning to hold it in uh, Maldives. So Maldives is going to be fun. It's going to be a five star resort by the sea. Most of the I hope there are some villas which will be available, which will be on the sea itself. Tone. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, and again, uh, it's it's a gathering of a lot of uh, like-minded people from money managers to head fund, head fund managers to investors to companies to traders. Uh, a lot of people from the financial industry industry gather together for five days and talk finance, learn finance, understand each other's perspective. It's one of the greatest events that I have been to in the last few years, and I hope uh, if you guys are in the, interested in the next event, uh, which will be held in most likely in March 2025, uh, head over to our website and you can basically book in an early bird ticket uh, to the event. So, Toon, let's start off talking a little bit about uh, market breadth of SNP. Like we have seen quite a good bullish price action in the last few months. We talked about it last week as well, but Right now, the market breadth is sitting at its best, in, you know, from the since the first week of September. So that means 53% of S&P stocks are now trading above their 200-day moving average. And as we are aware, Tone, and obviously you have you have been repeating this thing a lot of time. The 200-day moving average is a crucial moving average. How do you see the price action? Do you think, from your perspective? that it is a good time to start entering into the market if somebody does not have any exposure not a financial advice but from your knowledge what would you like to uh, would you like to put some light on it well unfortunately the best time to enter the stock market in 2023 was literally the same month that was the best time to enter the stock market in 2022 which was of course october uh, we've talked about this for two years in a row now Uh, with the Financial Summit brand, and I've been talking about it on my channel, uh, because the markets tend to reverse in October, especially when they've been crashing into October. Now, what happens right now, right here, right now, uh, you know, three weeks later, so the market had one of the best run-ups over like a three-week span, probably in history. Like I'm not, I haven't really paid attention to that metric. But I'm just looking at how much the stock market has got off in the last three weeks. And it's almost like Bitcoin. It's like Bitcoin has skyrocketed in the last three weeks. And so has uh, the stock market. Bitcoin probably maybe going back a full month. And I'm not a person that likes to chase the market. And yes, that can get you in a little bit of trouble uh, not chasing the markets if you don't have any position at all. But if you have some position in the market, but not as big of a position as you want it to be in the market, then you just got to hang in there with your partial position and wait for a reasonable pullback. So, uh, and in regards of people who have positions in the market, Tone, uh, what would your recommendation be on price action? How you're seeing the price action developing over the last few weeks? Uh, Do you think we are coming close to a market top and we might see some sort of retracement, uh, both from the perspective of, I I don't want to talk Bitcoin right now, but like the rallies that we have seen in the last few months, do you think that goes, uh, you know, we'll get a nice green Christmas as well? Well, when you say having a position in the stock market, the question becomes how big of a position. If you are 100% invested in the stock market out of your maximum 100% allocation into the stock market, I say just hold on to it because it is not yet showing signs of a pullback. So uh, just hold on to it or maybe wait for an MRI uh, sell indication, which I don't believe it's on right now, and uh, and then maybe take some profit in the market. But uh, for me personally, whenever I am in a position uh, of a market that I'm expecting to continuously rising over the longer term, what knocks me out of that market is not some kind of a target price, but what knocks me out is a stop loss uh when the market starts to pull back now the only exception to this rule is maybe a fibonacci level 
and also the an MRI cell indication. But the MRI cell indication needs to you know look a certain way. It has to come on a blow off top. Uh, it needs to come with the reversal candle. Uh, and if it happens to be at a Fibonacci level, then uh, yeah, that that could be an area where I would uh, take profit in the market. Otherwise, I just slowly keep raising the stop loss. And in this environment, I would not even exit all the way. I would exit partially, uh, maybe 25%, maybe 30%. But that's the situation if you are 100% already invested in the stock market. Now, if you are 50% invested in the stock market out of a maximum 100% that you could be invested in the stock market, now it's a little bit different. Now, I would not take any profit on a pullback, and I would treat the pullback as, you know, uh, as the ability to add on to my position. And if I was minimally invested in a stock market at, say, 20%, uh, I would, again, uh, pray for that pullback. Uh, but if the pullback doesn't come, then I would have to enter more into the market. This is what happened to me in the Bitcoin position with the Bitcoin allocation. Now, in the stock market version of that, that was very different. Uh, Bitcoin did not pull back into a perfect buying opportunity, uh, but the stock market did. The stock market pulled back perfectly with an October reversal. Uh, Bitcoin didn't do that. Bitcoin was floating out there, somewhat consolidating, somewhat pulling back, and then rallied like a bandit on fake news off of Cointelegraph, which I'm kind of pissed about. Now, I recognize right away that the fake news was going to rally the market higher. And, uh, you know, the $25,000 area, uh, 25, 26, where it was nicely consolidating and was probably going to put in a slightly lower low. Now, I knew those prices were not coming back. But I also didn't think that it would continue rallying on fake news the way it did. Uh, then it continued to rally with additional e ETF clarity and um, the Binance disaster and the whole CZ legal situation uh, did not pull back the market at all, which I found very, very interesting. Uh, like every time it started to crash, it immediately rallied back up. So Bitcoin is being very, very resilient right now. And I think it is being helped by, uh, you know, the massive rise in the stock market and people continuing to recognize that they are underweight in Bitcoin with the ETF eventually being approved, probably towards the second half of next year or worst case scenario in 2026. Sorry, in 2025. Yeah, but don't... Uh... I mean, I, obviously, my, my aim for discussion about Bitcoin was later, but now we are into that discussion. And I basically want to ask you this. Now, stock market is around 1.5% away from its all-time high, if I'm not mistaken. No, around 4.5%. Four four yeah, my bad, 4.5%. It's 4 .5%. away from, um, I think, this year's high. But I think it's about 5% yeah. away from so the all-time I think it has already created uh, this year's, it has already broken this year's high. Yeah, it's broken this year's high on Nasdaq at least and uh, went above it and then came below. Uh, but from the perspective of all-time high, we are very close to all-time highs, whereas Bitcoin is still lagging. So how do you see the, the Bitcoin's performance against S&P? Like visibly, if you look, if we just look at the chart, it's quite visible. Bitcoin is very weak compared to the stock market right now. Even though we can, from other perspective, we can say that the stock market uh, the Bitcoin had a much deeper bearish market structure and we can we can say that and we can say, okay, it's still rising. Or it, can we say, is it just coiling right now for that mass, massive move up and to catch up with stock market? Because I do not, I disagree to the point that Bitcoin is being resilient against stock market. I think Bitcoin is lagging way back right now. There's a lot more area to cover for it. So I wouldn't necessarily say that Bitcoin is lagging the stock market because if you look at it from uh, if you look at it from the perspective of percentage away from the all time high, yeah, Bitcoin is like thirty percent away from the all time high. Sorry, Bitcoin is a hundred percent away from the all time high. Uh, we're at thirty seven right now. The all time high was at sixty eight. So we're about forty forty five percent away. I'm sorry. We're 40, 45% down from the all-time high on the low side. 
So Bitcoin would have to almost double to catch up. Now, the stock market is 5% away from the all-time high. But in, in that perspective, we're 5% to the downside from the all-time high. And all the stock market has to do is go up 5%. If you're looking at it from those terms, then sure. But if you look at it from uh, a year ago level, right? Bitcoin is sitting at $15,000. Uh, that was the low for the bear market in Bitcoin over the last year and a half. And Bitcoin is now up w- over 100%. We're up about 120. And the stock market, where's the stock market? Well, if you look at the stock market lows, uh, stock market is up, what, maybe 15%? Bitcoin is up over 100 So it can actually be easier for Bitcoin to double at this, uh, at this point uh, than for the stock market to rally another 5%. So uh, I'm not, uh, I, I can't sit here and say the stock market will definitely have an all-time high before Bitcoin. That certainly is not guaranteed. Bitcoin can easily break the all-time high before the stock market does, though I am expecting both of them to do so next year. Uh, but it's very debatable which one is going to do it first. No, uh, I agree. I mean, nobody can predict price. So how I was looking at the market, because I was doing my analysis today, this, mo- this morning, I was sitting at the charts and I was like, okay, how, is, how are the long-term charts looking? And I was looking at the price action from March to uh, from March 2020 uh, until the highs were created uh, for Bitcoin in November 21. Uh, so I was looking at the whole price action and I basically just made up Fibonacci and I was like, okay, till where did we retrace? We retraced into the golden pocket. Perfect. We are now bouncing out of it. So I was like, okay, how did the stock market do in the same period? And stock market retraced into the golden pocket, recovered for the same price action from the same time with the same lows, recovered. And right now it's about to break the all time. So I was just trying to compare the relative strength of stock market to Bitcoin in this whole rally up and down. So that's why I wanted to ask you that question. But I do understand your uh, theory as well that stock market could basically dump from here and not create the all time. I Well, what, what to do then? So totally agreed. Uh, now, uh, do you have any anything to add on that? Like, I just wanted to put it out, like what I was looking at and why I was looking at it like that. Uh, no, I mean, that's pretty much it. Other than, look, when Bitcoin goes into a bull market, it goes up multiple hundreds of percent. When S&P goes into a bull market, I mean, what are we going to get? 20%, maybe 25? Yeah. <laughs> Maximum 25. Right. And, and, and Bitcoin is going to, Bitcoin is going to go up like four or five hundred percent, no problem. And uh, we're not even cherry picking the lows. Let's not even go with the fifteen thousand dollar price. I mean, realistically, people should have recognized that the bull market is here at around, let's say, twenty five thousand. Um, that's that's when I recognized it. I recognized the bull market on the pullback from twenty five to twenty. Uh, once the the way we rallied off of twenty k was absolutely incredible. That's when I knew the bull market is here at that 20K level. Now, if you were unsure and three days went by, Bitcoin was back to 25,000. It literally rallied from 20,000 back to 24 in three days. And uh, okay, fine, you missed it. You missed the $20,000 low. Bitcoin is back to 25K. So at that 25K level, everyone should have recognized the bull market. It then went from 25 to 30. Then it pulled back to 25 twice. People had twice, they, they had two opportunities to buy the dip of Bitcoin at 25,000. So the, the, there can't be any excuses as to missing the start of the Bitcoin bull market. Now, yes, some people are still pessimistic. Some people still think Bitcoin is going to go down and they'll get a chance to buy it at 11,000. I think these people are crazy, but hey, you know. Um, Oh, hey, uh, you're, you're typing and you're not on mute, so we can hear that. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, people should have recognized that the, the dip at 25000 unless you were hell-bent that the bear market is still here and you're going to get your chance to buy it at 11000 I was not one of these people. Now, is it possible that Bitcoin falls to 11000 Yeah, anything's possible. I mean, it crashed down to 4500 during the pandemic. Uh, in March of 2020, which probably would have never happened had uh, you know the COVID lockdowns didn't happen, but the stock market wouldn't have crashed either. But that's an unrealistic expectation. That was like luck. That and some people, you know, got destroyed by that. Right? Like if you were leveraged long, 
uh, didn't expect it, it crushed you. But at the same time, like you, no one should be you know leveraged to the gills long because you know a black swan can crash Bitcoin down to eleven, like it did in in March of 2020. Uh, but on the counter side of that, you shouldn't also be you know 90% sure Bitcoin is going to go down and give you an opportunity to buy it at eleven thousand dollars. I mean that that's equally as crazy as being you know uh, 40, 50 percent. A leverage long right now, uh, thinking that it's never going to pull back. They're, they're equally crazy positions. So uh, the bull market should have been recognized, and uh, yeah, some position uh, long should have been always, always warranted, or at least you know hold on to your hold position. That's uh, that, that's kind of uh, my view on that. And in this bull market, uh, as Using twenty five percent as a sorry twenty five thousand as a realistic starting point, I'm still expecting you know at least uh, four to five doublings, right? So that's four hundred. Uh, well, a hundred percent is one doubling, right? So four doublings would be four hundred percent. That's uh, four doublings, and twenty five percent. You know, if you uh, double that four times, takes you to fifty. Takes you to uh, takes you to 200, right? So that's probably what we're looking at in the Bitcoin bull market. Now, how long is it going to take? I don't know. Now, the longer it takes, uh, the uh, I, I guess the, the lower the price can be. Like if the bull market continues for, let's say, two and a half years, like an overextended bull market, but the price only makes it to 150, that could be the top because it took so long to get there. But if we rally, let's say ne- early next year, uh, in the next, let's say six to nine months, we rally to 150,000, there's no way that's going to be the top. So again, it's time and price. Uh, the shorter the bull market, the higher it is based on time. The shorter time the Bitcoin bull market lasts, the higher the price needs to go to compensate for the short amount of time. So if the bull market top happens uh, within the next, uh, let's say, in the first half of next year, we probably need to break quarter million dollars, maybe even get to 300,000 if the bull market top is going to happen sometime next year. But if the bull market top is going to happen in early 2026, it doesn't have to go all the way to 300,000. It only needs to go, you know, let's say one doubling from the prior all time high. It only needs to go to like maybe 140, 150. And this is the concept that a lot of people don't understand. They think that if the bull market lasts longer, then the price has to go higher. But that's not true at all. Uh, in fact, what I just explained is the complete opposite of that. The longer the bull market lasts, the less high the price needs to go because it's always time and price. And it's the same on the reverse side. When the bear market hits, the lower the price goes, the shorter in time the bear market needs to last. And uh, the, the, the slower the price falls and the, and the less deep the bear market, uh, then it can last an extendedly long period of time. Now, there are also very bad combinations when it lasts a long period of time and it falls a lot. And on the flip side, you can have very good scenarios where it lasts a long time and it goes up a lot. But the point is, it doesn't have to do that. I totally agree. Like We have have already seen quite a few bear markets, like not us as human beings, but like not me personally, but from the perspective of stats and we have seen bear markets which lasted only 42 days in S- in the you know s&p index and we have seen bear markets that have lasted one 1200 days in the you know in s&p and so I, I, you're absolutely correct and i can give specific examples i mean it's happened in bitcoin if you look at um april of 2015 sorry april of 2013 where the price of bitcoin went from ten dollars the bitcoin was ten dollars when the year began when 2013 began, Bitcoin was $10, maybe 12 at most. And by April, it was all the way at 250 bucks. But then what happened uh, after that? 
literally within seven days, the price fell from two hundred and fifty thousand two hundred and fifty dollars all the way to fifty five bucks. I remember this really, really well. Now that is an eighty percent correction in the price of Bitcoin, but it only took seven days, maybe even less. It took like six days to fall like that. That massive eighty percent crash in seven days was the end of the bear market. And then it ra- it started rallying again. And by the end of the year, it was back to 1300. Now, had we were falling a lot slower, uh, we probably would have been falling the rest of the year. And that would have been the top for the year at 250 instead of 1300. But we literally had an 80% correction in the blink of an eye. And it ended that mid bear market. So people don't even see it as a bear market because it only took seven days. Like, because it only took seven days, people were they didn't have the time to sell their positions. <laughs> they were like, right. Sell I sell? <laughs> right. That's, no, that's one, true. no one considers the, the third week of April or whatever it was, the second week of April, as a Bitcoin bear market because it only took a week, right? But it fell 80%. Meanwhile, uh, Bitcoin could have fallen a lot less than 80%. It could have fallen uh, 60% or 50%. But it could have been falling for, let's say, a year and a half. And everyone is like, oh, this bear market sucks. This bear market's terrible because it lasted a year and a half, but it only fell 60%, right? It's almost like, like, what is worse? Well, what's worse is which one caused you to sell your Bitcoin, right? That's the one that's worse. If the seven days, if you didn't have any, if you weren't leveraged and you didn't have any stop losses, the thing fell 80%, you didn't panic. And then a week later, you're like, oh, that was great. I'm back to, you know, all time highs of two hundred and (laughs) seventy dollars. Right. You didn't sell. So you're happy. Uh, And uh, on the flip side, you know, that year and a half bear market, you know, you had medical issues, you had to buy a house, you know, whatever. You ended up getting divorced, you know, whatever caused you to sell that Bitcoin at a 50 percent loss. That's the painful bear market. Right. On the flip side, if that 60 percent year and a half drop and you didn't quit your job, and you continue to purchase Bitcoin, you loved that bear market, uh, while a one-week 80% crash could have you know, forced liquidated you into zero. Now you hate that bear market, right? So it, 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 it's always you know, hindsight of, you know, did you accumulate Bitcoin, or did, did you lose Bitcoin, or did nothing happen to your Bitcoin, right? So based on that, is which is more painful and which is less painful. But people need to just have it in their head that the time component is equally as important as the price component. And uh, both of them can damage you or you know, one of them could make it better for you. And sometimes there are really bad scenarios where you have a very deep bear market in time and in price. As an example of that, you can look at gold. Now, gold made a top in 1980 at $800, and it didn't bottom until the year 2000 at 200 bucks. That is both a very deep and long bear market. It took 20 freaking years, and uh, it corrected 80%. Well, gold gold kind of does that in cycles. That's like the commodity cycle of you know eight years on eight years off cycle that it always has i think uh isn't it tone like commodities it's to be said that commodities trades in a eight year long bull, bull market and bear market cycles um yes and no right Not always right because the next uh the next bull market top in gold took place in 2011 and the low came in in 2015 so that was a fall from approximately two thousand dollars down to thirteen hundred. That is still, you know, a decent correction. That's about a forty percent mm-hmm. correction. And, That's a massive one, right? Gold is now. Uh, it took less time. It only took five years, not twenty, and uh, it only collected forty percent, not eighty. So that was a combination of not as bad of a price correction and not as bad of a time correction. But it also could have been in between. Uh, gold could have fallen, say, 60% and taken a very short amount of time. 
or the bear market in gold could still be happening 10 years later. Uh, and yet it could have only been down, let's say, 20, 30 percent at the worst. So uh, Bitcoin has, has examples of all of these types. And uh, the one we just experienced was a standard correction of both time and uh, price, but not the worst case scenario. Uh, those that still make fun of me that I was expecting a $1,000 price of Bitcoin, uh, in reality, it was more like $1,500, which is a big difference. $1,000 versus $1,500 is a pretty big difference. Now, Bitcoin fell to $3,000. That was my middle-of-the-road bear market target. That wasn't the optimistic one, and that wasn't the pessimistic one. The pessimistic one was $1,500. The middle-of-the-road one was $3,000. But I also had a time target, and my time target for a Bitcoin bear market, uh, again, we were middle of the road. Um, I thought that uh, while the price made middle of the road, the time also made middle of the road, or maybe the time was a little too short. Because remember, that low came in within the same year as the top, and I felt that was a little too short time-wise for a Bitcoin bear market. Now, don't forget, a year later, more than a year later, we fell all the way to $4,000, even $3,800 to be exact, right? So now, what's the time target? Well, the, and by the way, uh, I'm still of the belief that if BitMEX didn't pull the plug on their server, the price of Bitcoin would have gone lower and possibly breached the $3,000 low. And now we would be debating when did the bear market of Bitcoin end uh, after the 2017 top? Did it end in December of 2018, where it made the $3,000 low? Or did it happen in March of 2020, right? And uh, if it was March of 2020, that's a very long bear market. We're talking over three, uh, over three years of a bear market in Bitcoin had it put in a low. It didn't put in a low. That low was only 3,800 versus 3,100 uh, two years earlier. But that was a very scary moment for a shorter term, you know, a very short bear market based on uh, time. But it was a huge price crash of like 60, 70% uh, in March uh, when it fell from, uh, I think, about 12,000 uh, within weeks it fell down to just under 4000 and a lot of us believe that if the if the you know if trading wasn't halted it would have gone significantly lower so 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 you just got to keep the time factor in mind and i think no, that this bear market has has played its role in time and in price but how long the bull market's going to be uh, that's a little too early to tell no, 100%. Like, obviously, people look at bull markets and bear markets in multiple different ways. Some people say that the bear market only ends when the all-time highs are broken. But if you go from the perspective of technical analysis, or even from the perspective of any sort of analysis, a 20% drop in price action, this is more for our listeners. Guys, a 20% drop in price action on either side, like if it falls from the highest 20%, it, in S&P at least, it's called a bear market. We are in a bear market territory. If the price rises 20% from the lows, that is your bull market territory. So uh, the definitions can be really different for different people. Moving on to it, uh, sorry, I kind of wanted to just send, put some education out there as well. Uh, moving on to tech stocks, uh, basically, I want to start with Microsoft and OpenAI, like a lot of chatter in the past couple of weeks. We touched on it last week, but I want to go a bit in depth of this whole circus that happened during a few days in OpenAI. Sam Altman was fired, then Microsoft hired him, and then he again became the CEO. In that meantime, Microsoft was pumping like anything. Microsoft saw a major inflow of money coming into the stock market. You know, price rose by, I think, around 10 to 11 percent in a matter of few days. How do you see this whole picture? I mean, uh, what are you looking at? Do you think that OpenAI 
is going to now go in a better direction and do you think that open ai is going to be the company of the future if microsoft bought open ai then i'm very skeptical I mean, microsoft tends to just fuck up everything it touches uh well, like as an example of that we can look at skype which could have been the leader in um you know uh skype is the predecessor to what we all use telegram whatsapp uh that was skype before that uh for both um uh voice over ip and messaging and uh look what microsoft did with it no one uses it anymore and uh so if microsoft is now in control of open ai then they'll probably be way better competitors going down the line uh i mean they'll still make money off of it enough people will use it uh it will be the default ai in windows uh, but it's not going to be the leader in innovation at all and eventually something will surpass it uh, i i am in the same oh i just wanted to tell so, you i heard that their structure the way open ai was set up it was it's like a nonprofit. it has a weird st structure and that's part of this problem So uh, from what I am aware, uh, I think it's more or less. So what they wanted to do is not to basically put everything as an open source. And then the previous board was saying that, OK, you cannot do that. We need to sell it. So Sam, he, Sam was fired. But then obviously Satya Nadella said then he said, OK, we'll make the same thing in Microsoft. And then they were like, no, 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 don't go. We'll make a new board and you can do what you want. So yeah, I agree with you. Uh, and uh, that's what the structure was kind of uh there guys if you have any questions uh, for all our, all our listeners any questions you can put them in the comment or you can raise your hand and we'll invite you onto the stage and you can ask your questions or put your give your inputs as well uh in, in the space we are a very open space from that perspective so feel free to put your questions in the comments or uh request to come and talk to tone me or uh or other speakers so don't uh leaving apart microsoft and open ai tech stocks have basically basically uh, basically the mega tech uh, stocks have basically shown the most returns that they have had since the dot com bubble right in this year and it's kind of visible that it is basically it is being generated by just a few companies and most of the companies are concentrating on ai as their next step how do you see the future of ai and how do you see the future of ai in crypto if any so I don't see all that much future in AI in crypto, uh, other than one day, you know, there will be AI programs that are so autonomous and they will have, you know, Bitcoin as money that they can actually function. Like, like a, again, you can think of uh, Terminator, where these robots are, uh, you know, controlled by an AI, Skynet. Uh, but now these robots can have commerce because they can use Bitcoin as money. So that's something to be kind of scared of in the future. Uh, also, if let's say Uber gets challenged by an AI company, like a straight up AI company where uh, uh, the car itself can hold its own money. Uh, I remember Jonathan Mohan did a presentation on this in like 2015 or something, where he literally talked about, hey, imagine if, uh, uh, if a company launches just off of AI programs, and like your car is completely autonomous, like uh, like it's not even your car. It's like the car owns itself and it drives itself and it knows when to go to the mechanic itself. And on the screen, it displays to the mechanic well, like what needs to be fixed. And uh, uh, it can pay the mechanic in Bitcoin and then the car could, you know, choose who it wants to pick up, uh, which passengers and uh, drive them around, get paid in Bitcoin and then, you know, additional cars and like start its own uber company just you know as an autonomous car that started out as a single car it's uh it's it's really really fascinating uh where things can go uh with ai in the future now i personally uh don't have uh, I, I think it's useful i think ai is gonna uh, i mean every company should have a should hire people based on their knowledge of how to use ai tools uh, because you can replace like a dozen employees with one employee that knows how to utilize AI. Uh, but you still need a human being to utilize AI. 
uh, like for example, like there are certain things that I still don't understand how these companies can't solve. For example, when I make a YouTube video, there are hundreds of scammy comments to that video, and I can identify this in milliseconds that this is a scammy comment, and yet no one can build an AI to fix this problem. Uh, it, it's just kind of silly, right? How people think that AI is going to solve these really advanced problems, but they can't even make one to solve something incredibly simple. Like getting rid of obvious spam should be a simple problem. It shouldn't well, they end be up shadow banning you. <laughs> Instead of solving the problem, they shadow ban you. Correct. Well, yeah, they do. Right. So uh, the amount of like fake me's on instagram and twitter that message people or like, like th these are these should not be that hard of problems when people are having these grand dreams of what ai is going to solve so yes ai is solving some problems i mean i'm dying to find a good graphic design ai so that uh, i mean i've i've spent tens of thousands of dollars on graphic design over a year and uh, I'm hoping to replace that one day with a $12 a month subscription, right? To a really good uh, graphic design AI and eventually video editing AI. Well, like these are the kinds of tools that uh, AI can do. But uh, anytime I make a phone call to some company, whether it's my credit card company, or whatever, and I get the automated message with 50 different options for me to choose from, there's the, the option of what I actually need is just never there, right? So, uh, again, uh, maybe these AI tools will get better, but for really complicated stuff, we're not talking about, you know, you wrote an email and then you wanted to paraphrase it so that it sounds better. Uh, for anything really, really deep and important, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while, but some of these things still require dozens and dozens of employees, which could easily be replaced. And that's an incredible productivity. Uh, go on. Uh, Unconfiscatable, I think you have your hands up. So as somebody who tests out something new in AI at least once a week, it still has a long way to go. Um, and it's not just the tool it still has to, you still have to know how to use it. Like you could be an amazing video editor, but if you don't know the subject you're working on and you don't understand the subject you're working on AI or not, it's going to be difficult. So they can set parameters up to try to identify important, you know, headlines and things like that, but you still need the human to make sure it's correct. And I do think it will make strides and I do think it will get easier. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's got a ways to go. Um, I would like to add something to that. I think the biggest use of AI in crypto is on the blockchain itself, like for the safety, you know how blockchain can safely store and preserve the large data of transactions. Now, I think this is a game changer for blockchain because the protocols that take place during a crypto transaction, whether it's, I don't know, it's crypto ARI, IRA buy or crypto trade, which will be processed much quickly as IAI can process through it much faster. Maybe that's one of the biggest uses I see with the, um, with the blockchain itself. There might be a lot more, but I think it's not just for maybe graphic designing or video editing and stuff like that. It's more like from the very basic blockchain perspective as well. So the, the reason why I don't see it that way is because I go back to the fundamental principle that uh, the only blockchain that matters is the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, everything else just uses a buzzword blockchain because, you know, they didn't like the word Bitcoin, so they made up the word blockchain. <laughs> so to me, uh, it's literally just Bitcoin. It's the, the, those are the only transactions that are, that are immutable and are going to be around forever. I have no such confidence, even in Ethereum, and people call Ethereum a blockchain. To me, Ethereum is just a centralized database. Uh, but so for me, uh, I try not to even use the word blockchain. It's just either Bitcoin or databases. And uh, from that perspective, 
Uh, is AI useful in databases? Sure. Uh, but whether it's you know a SQL server or Ethereum, uh, at that point, to me, uh, there's just not that much of a difference. I, I think I, I, I kind of vibe with you on this tone because uh, the how I see Ethereum, and I was looking at the structure as well, and it doesn't, it, it is a database. It's nothing more than that. Uh, so I totally agree with you, and I agree with the Bitwise as well because uh, yes, there can be a product which can be faster from the perspective of the hyper blockchain being used for in you know AI being used for that. But if we see from the perspective of crypto, for me, there's only one crypto that's Bitcoin. Everything else is speculation and companies. So the, yeah, it, there can be a product which can help make transactions faster using AI, but yeah, how can we use it in Bitcoin? And even I'm kind of, you know, in the in a blurry area in that. With that, uh, if there's no nothing to add on that, I want to move on to another topic, Tone, or anyone else. Well, let's move on then. So, Tone, uh, so that was about AI. Okay, now let's go to go a little bit towards Apple. Firstly, can you explain to our listeners what a profit to sales ratio really is? And then my question to you is, so Apple, again, for the last seven years, uh, you know, despite having, you know, bad years, good years in overall, they have still beaten their PS ratio. You know, it, it remains high uh, even now above seven, despite right a full year or, of revenue decline. What is this company really doing? Apple as a firm, is it a software company? Is it a mobile phone company what exactly is apple and how are they able to maintain such significance in the market where their profit to uh, you know ps ratio is still higher than normal even if they're having a bad year what is exactly happening there tony you're muted muted again okay so apple is involved in many many businesses and apple users people that love apple phones i mean they just they, they don't quit. Uh, most of my family actually uses Apple phones, contrary to my objections to that. And uh, uh, look, people just love Apple products, and they continue to sell a decent amount of Apple products. Now, Android dominates the global south because Android devices can be significantly cheaper. Uh, personally, I think Android devices are better, but it's good that people have a choice. Uh, Apple an Apple phone or an Android phone, it's good that there are choices. And this is where people, uh, I'm going to go off on a tangent here, and this is where people uh, make the mistake of choices in products versus choices in standards. And uh, I don't think there should be choices in standards. They're either, uh, they're either good and efficient or they create inefficiencies. And standards need to be kind of um, you know, I don't want to say the word monopoly, but standards need to be somewhat universal to make life easier and better. So as an example, uh, I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world that Apple continued to have their proprietary charger when it was obvious that a USB-C charger is a significantly better uh, global standard because everything else moved to USB-C, but not the Apple phones. So, and this is where those analogies is like when, when the shit coiners always used, oh, you just want there to be one thing. You don't want people to have a choice. And uh, this is the example that I use. No, it, the people should choose between Android or Apple or a Microsoft phone, which didn't go anywhere. Uh, but they should all have a standard charger. Uh, same thing with like Teslas versus other electric vehicles. Like it looks like the Tesla charger won out, which I was a little surprised on. But there needs to be one electric vehicle charger uh, around the world. Uh, there needs to be some kind of a consensus on the charger. But uh, you can have different electric cars, right? That's where the choices come in. Same thing with electricity grids, right? Like it's insane that there was like 18 different plugs into walls as you travel around the world. And uh, like it should be just one unanimous consensus, right? But at this point, it's hard to, uh, you know, to get an entire country to change their outlet. 
uh, or maybe there should be a consensus that uh, countries should make a like a universal plug. Well, like uh, so, uh, but people don't want to spend that kind of money, right? But it create it will create inefficiencies. So uh, that, that's just a tangent that went off on. But uh, when it comes to Apple, I mean, Apple will continue to do well. I mean, Apple is it, it's a huge company, and they always find a way to produce a product cheaply and uh, sell it to. Uh, I mean, sell it for a nice chunk of premium when they sell the products. Now, yes, Apple had to leave China for their manufacturing, but they found other cheap places to make it done. They're certainly not making it in America. And uh, they continue to have pretty good margins. And uh, Apple had lots of cheap money on financing. They were not in debt. They had lots of cash. So Apple is always able to weather the, you know, the storm of a bear market way better than many other companies. Uh, so that's one part of it. And uh, the PE ratios and other metrics, I mean, they're kind of irrelevant. Uh, as we discussed in this space last time, people don't uh, buy Apple stock for what it's going to do next month. Uh, people buy, not well, some people do, but the majority of the people that are invested in Apple stock, they're looking five, 10 years down the line. They're not thinking about how Apple is going to do next quarter. Uh, the big investors in Apple are like you know early stage investors. I mean, no one in, invests in a seed round of a company looking to get out in three months. People invest in a seed round of a company looking to be uh, l- looking to get out. You know, three four years later when the company get, is close to going public or after it goes public. It it's no different. Like, like it's the same mentality for most large investors in Apple today. They're not buying Apple stock for the next quarter. They're buying Apple stock for the next fifteen quarters, uh, and that's why uh, these PE ratios don't really matter, and they can go out of whack because people are investing into the future. That that was exactly what I wanted to bring out from you to make people understand that sometimes these PE ratio PS ratios. They are just numbers, and you need to just believe in the firm and invest in the long term. Th- thank you so much, Stone. Uh, let's move on from our tech and future of AI and Apple and all stuff, and go a little bit towards commodity, Stone. So I have just one commodity in focus today, and that is crude oil, right? We see a decline for the five consecutive weeks in crude oil. Uh, that's the longest losing streak in around two years. Before that, we see a rise in price. So. Well, uh, think of it the way we want to think of it. So it has fallen 5% on the news that OPEC uh, will be delaying their meeting. Also, it got heavily rejected from the technical perspective from the 200-day moving average. Is it just the technicals that's driving it tone or is it something fundamentally happening with oil prices that is driving the price lower? Um, You know, I, I don't have much to comment on. Um, I don't know what's happening with the price of oil. I, I don't have a good explanation as to why it's dropping. And um, you remember, this is the same conversation we had at the financial summit where uh, we discussed oil in a, in a big group of like 30 people. And most people came to the consensus that we're not sure why the price of oil is dropping in this environment uh, with the tensions in the Middle East, uh, with all the other stuff. Uh, so... Uh, I'm going to hold off on that until probably uh, next year, like Q1 of next year. I think this period in time will make sense. Uh, But in the future, I don't know where this additional supply of oil is coming from because China is using more oil. India is using more more energy. And uh, unless there's massive pumping in Venezuela that we don't know about and Massive additional pumping in the U.S. that the U.S. government is not, you know, being honest about because then they will piss off the Greens and uh, the other climate cl- crazies. So I, I don't know why the price of oil continues to drop because OPEC certainly reduced uh, the amount of oil that they're pumping out of the ground. I don't have much of an explanation other than I just can't see oil prices going much further. And uh, same thing with natural gas, and we are on uh, very critical MRI levels, uh, especially on oil. On oil, there's a weekly MRI next week as a buying opportunity. 
and I do trust it, and I do think the price of oil is about to rise. Uh, I I agree again. I think it's being manipulated. The price of oil. I don't think this is a real. Uh, I I treat it as a retracement more than a decline uh, personally. Because uh, looking at the chart, it basically doesn't. Uh, looking at the chart, it feels like oh, it's getting rejected from the 200-day moving average, and we might see lower prices because this might be a retest and failure of a proper retest. But it just doesn't feel right because of the whole fundamental scenario we are living in right now. So. Totally with you on that, and yeah, as we discussed in the financial summit, like what is really happening? Nobody was, everybody had the same consensus consensus that oil prices should rise from here. So yeah, I'm I'm trying to see what's happening, and for me, it's a buying opportunity uh, at a cheaper oil price. So if anybody wants some barrels of oil and keep it in their home, yeah, might be a good idea to get some. But yeah, depending on what you <laughs> what you fancy. Uh, Tone, let's move on from oil and to the most important part. A lot of things have happened in crypto tone over the last one, one or two weeks. I want to start off with CZ. The whole court case, the whole uh, CZ saying that yes, I am guilty, and then accepting it, and then obviously paying the fines for Binance side and CZ's personal side as well. Firstly, could you explain a little bit about, or could you put some, shed some light about what really happened, and uh, do you have any idea about what really happened with the whole case with Binance? So unfortunately, I can't. Um, I actually still have not listened to that a lawyer space that Jason Brett did with Joe Calasari and others. I just been really busy with other stuff, including unconfiscatable conference that's coming. So I have zero uh, information to share uh, on what the hell is happening with CZ. I don't. I didn't even know there was a criminal investigation into CZ. I remember the financial investigation into CZ from the SEC and others. And uh, at the time when we covered it, I was like, I kept asking, okay, so when is the Department of Justice, you know, criminal action going to happen against CZ? And I don't ever recall that action dropping. And yet somehow he's playing guilty to something. So I'm not sure what's really going on there. Uh, I am a bit confused myself. Uh, I, as you know, I never really I was never a big fan of Binance. Uh, I think uh, I, I think there are way better exchanges. Kraken being one of them was one of my uh, more favorite exchanges. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so yes, yeah, so I don't have much to share on that front. And uh, Joe Colasari is not here, unfortunately, uh, to provide uh, that. That, that. That's completely fine. Uh, from our listeners, if anyone wants to shed some light on it, if anyone is educated enough on the topic and can give some some of that and share that with the our, our, our audience that would be great uh feel free to request to speak and uh, yeah unconfiscatable has some something to shed light on go on so one thing that they did mention <clears throat> in that space is is that he's going to come back like arthur hayes and that's kind of the direction they see this going in if that makes sense to you uh, it doesn't because Arthur Hayes never came back, right? He basically retired. He just writes articles. He's not, uh, he left the company, but he never came back to being part of the company as far as I know. But again, I haven't really followed uh, what happened to Arthur Hayes. He, uh, I mean, it was great that he didn't do any jail time. He got house arrest for like six months or something. And, uh, but as far as I know, he just writes articles. Well, that seems to be the consensus that he'll end up in some position like that and he'll still be, you know, a private part owner of the company or something. And he's just going to kind of retire and right off into the sunset. And that, that's going to be some a nice sunny sunset with the amount of money that he would have made uh in the last few years uh, with Binance. Well, that's, yeah, that's completely I okay. I'm interested in like, I, I think it's interesting that they're giving him 18 months, I believe, to pay this $4 billion. Um, uh, also, there was some news that came out yesterday or today, I can't remember exactly, stating that uh, DOJ is asking for 10 years prison sentence uh, with his guilt, guilt plea, plea. So, not sure how accurate it is, and but if it if it is accurate, it would be a really interesting court case of 
paying so much uh, money uh, with the plea and then also paying and also serving jail time. So let's see how it goes. There was definitely the perspective in that space as well, that the the press conference was definitely a, it, I don't want to say it was staged, but it was very much, it was a, it was a production uh, to prove some kind of point. However, I'm not sure exactly what that point was. No, 100%. Uh, but Toon, with Binance now out of the picture, and now basically they all of their books are un going to be under DOJ and SEC's eyes for the next, I think, uh, three to four years. I think that's the thing. How do you, do you think that this was the last nail in the coffin for all these exchanges? And now will be the time when the big players will start stepping into the market and start step, stepping in with the ETFs, with their own holdings and their own exchanges and take over the crypto world the, day, the way they wanted to. Like, was this what SEC was waiting for? That's a good question. I don't really know. Uh, honestly, I don't think the big players want to be in crypto. Yes, uh, these other companies, uh, or I mean, th these other companies made a lot of money, like the well, like Bitmax and uh, uh, Binance and many others. Uh, they made money, but these professional you know, exchanges and brokerages, they know that they made their money very, very scammy because uh, on all of these scam coins, I mean, Bitcoin is the only thing that is really legitimate there. So are they going to start adding Bitcoin? Maybe. Uh, it would be nice to see, you know, uh, like ICE or New York Stock Exchange. But this also goes back to one of the things that I've always said going back seven years in the traditional finance world there are exchanges and there are brokers this relationship is joined into one in the world of crypto uh, like no one has an account with the new york stock exchange no one has an account with nasdaq no one has an account with you know uh the pink sheets which is like the penny stock exchange no one has account with them now you have your accounts with uh, you know, Charles Schwab and Ameritrade and uh, some crazies have their account with Robinhood. Those are brokers. You know, that's a service provider that purchases the asset you want on the exchange. Uh, so there is, I don't know, uh, 100 brokers maybe, and they tap into, you know, half a dozen exchanges that have all the liquidity. In the crypto world, uh it it your broker is your exchange which is uh well, like a weird thing so i'm not sure how transition would happen into the traditional world i mean because over there there's a separation between exchanges and brokers which doesn't exist in the crypto world so there is a you know that's something that needs to be resolved before uh, you know, so some of the stuff that is happening in the crypto space gets moved over to the traditional space. Now, the opposite could also be true, where uh, if the SEC and the CFTC like no longer have control of the global markets, uh, because remember, I'm also looking through this into the future. And in the future, I do not believe America as a single country controlling the world. So what happens in the future, uh, to me, is very, very murky right now, because I always thought that if an exchange like a Kraken, for example, or a Coinbase, ran a really good business and became so unreasonably wealthy that they end up purchasing the traditional brokerages and traditional exchanges. Like what happens if a Kraken or a Coinbase or, God forbid, a Binance has enough money to buy the New York Stock Exchange, right? Or they have the money to buy Charles Schwab. What happens then? Or Fidelity, right? Uh, what if uh, uh, one of these crypto exchanges just has more money than Fidelity and they decide to buy Fidelity? Uh, well, Fidelity is more like a broker. They're not an exchange. But what if they buy Fidelity and the New York Stock Exchange? Now what happens? So. Uh, also, what happens when a company like Apple 
decides to go public on the Bitcoin blockchain in the future because uh, the United States has collapsed. The, the EU, New York as financial capital of the world no longer exists. And uh, uh, there's, there's risks involved, right? I mean, the way um, I don't want to get too geopolitical here, right? But uh, like there are things that most people aren't thinking of. Everyone thinks that New York is going to be the financial capital of the world forever. But that's not true. Uh, London was before that. Amsterdam was before that. Uh, but they're no longer the capital of the world. Now, why aren't they the capital of the world anymore? Well, in the case of Britain and the U and London, uh, World War II took them out. Uh, the U.S. is dying to start World War III with both Russia and China at the same time. So what happens if, you know, God forbid, New York City is destroyed? Like, uh, I mean, yeah, the Twin Towers went down uh, back in uh, on September 11th, and the new and the stock market, the American stock market was down for I think four days. Uh, the stock market was closed for four days, maybe five days. The stock market it was just closed and down. Now, what happens if it's 9-11 times 100, right? What happens if the New York stock market doesn't open for six months, right? The financial capital will move somewhere else. Uh, these companies may uh, go public on the Bitcoin blockchain if it has enough side chains. We are talking, let's say, five, six years down the line when the technology is more stable, more trusted. Uh, what happens then, right? The New York or New York as financial capital world may never come back. Uh, like that's just you know one example of what can happen. Other examples of what can happen as well. So uh, going down the line, I don't think that it's going to be the way New York markets have always worked. I, I think that things are going to change. I don't know how they're going to change, uh, but they're going to change. And uh, 10, 15 years from now, I don't think we're going to be talking. Uh, I don't think we're going to see the American stock market in the same light as we see it today. I think it, things could be very, very different. Uh, you, ha you have anything to add on that? So two things on Binance. Um, number one, they're still in business. I mean, they just find them hard, made him step down, but they can still conduct business as usual. Number two, the way they were the way they discussed their punishment um uh, they they talked about it as being very institutional and they were treated very much like a, a financial legitimate financial institution in terms of their punishment and how they were treated for whatever that's worth no that that that's that's good to know like the reason i asked this question is because there was a video com the interview coming from SEC, sec commissioner uh stating that there is no reason for us to stand in the way of spot bitcoin etf i've put it in the nest so that was basically on the day that cz was uh cz pleaded guilty so on the like after that, like I think three, four hours in London time, it was around 8 p.m. I think when it came out. Also, uh, a report came out from JPMC saying that GBTC's, GBTC could see a ma massive outflow of around 2.7 billion on the ETF conversion. Now, you, we all know that they're also filing for uh, ETF. Not only do you see gbtc getting an etf approval before anyone else uh do you think that is a more you know easier etf to be approved compared to others tone you're on mute um yes i actually do i do think that gbtc becoming a proper etf is uh is probably the easier path forward because the ticker already exists. It's already being traded. Uh, people already know about it. I think from the SEC's perspective, uh, GBTC becoming a proper ETF uh, is the better choice. However, the current managers of GBTC have no experience running a real ETF. So that takes us back to BlackRock. BlackRock has a division that is you know, experienced at running an ETF. But the BlackRock is the first ETF to be approved. There is definitely going to be some yelling and screaming that the government is playing favoritism to their buddy at buddies at BlackRock. 
So the BF2 approved several at the same time. GBTC, BlackRock, and uh, maybe uh, Van Eyck. Uh, it will be tough for Valkyrie to get it because, again, they're unproven. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, maybe one more. Uh, you know, they approve like three to four at, a, at the, almost the same time. And then let them compete. Let, let them see who gets better volume. Uh, I think that's the more probably the most optimal way forward. And do you think that ETF approval is now priced into the BT, uh, BTC price? Or do you think they are already, because BlackRock came out a few weeks back saying that we are getting ready for the approval. So do you think they this whole bump to the upside, this whole price action that we are seeing might be BlackRock and all these firms now, GBTC not because they already have quite a bit. Uh, so they are already prepared for that. But maybe BlackRock and other firms are now trying to position themselves in the market or try to get to hold the stack because with spot ETF, they need to have the collateral associated, not the collateral, what do we call, what's the right word, I can't remember. But they need to have B BTC with them to be able to sell the uh, contracts. Um, wait, sorry. Um, can, you, can you just repeat the question? It was, uh, it was a my, really my long question. question. No, my question was basically that, do you think, firstly, that an ETF approval, obviously, we, we all are aware now, like, as oh, the commissioner is coming. Sorry. Is, it, is, it, is it priced in? Is it, that, that was the initial thing. Um, I think yeah. now it's priced in. Uh, I, it clearly wasn't priced in when Bitcoin was 25000 and the tweet went out. Uh, but now that, you know, the price has gone up like 30%, 30 35%, um, I think now it's pretty much priced in. Uh, I think there is an expectation that the ETF's coming. And at the, the next time, uh, the SEC rejects it. They need to make it clear that, yeah, we're rejecting it, but we are closer and closer and closer to the inevitability of approving it. So, uh, yes, I'm still of the belief that they're not going to approve it, but I'm also of the belief that they're going to stall. Uh, it's like, yeah, we're not approving it, but we're so close. Just like one more document, just fill out this one more sheet of paper. And then it's going to be, yeah, but just fill out this one more paragraph on this sheet of paper. And then it's going to be just one more sentence on this uh, sheet of paper. And then it'll be just one more letter. And then, it's, you know, and then like, no, you forgot to dot the I. Um, I think they're just going to stall, stall, stall. But as they stall, they're going to inch closer and closer and closer to giving people hope that it's in, that it's imminent. Uh, so I think the price is being priced in. Uh, the ETF is being priced into the price. Hey, Tone. Hey, Tone Vase. Uh, big fan. Been a fan of you since 2017. Um, nice. Thank yeah. you. Well, there's one question uh, in the comments, and then I'll go to you, Rush. Uh, the question, Tone, is, is it's coming in from somebody called All Is Well, Block N2. Uh, question is, has any specific ETF ever disclosed their Bitcoin wallet how do we get clarity and how do we do know that they don't print paper Bitcoin? I think that's a very good question, Tone. Uh, do you want to put Is some light question? on I mean, I see Joe Kalasari in the audience. Uh, oh, lovely. Can... I'm going to ask him about uh, yeah. CZ. Maybe he... I, I don't know, right? But like, what happens is, this is why, I mean, there is regulation. And uh, these companies, I mean, they follow regulation or there could be real consequences. Uh, like Grayscale, uh, Barry Silver did not like wake up one day and uh, and launch a, a Bitcoin quasi ETF. Like that didn't happen. Barry Silver ran a company called Second Market. I had experience with Second Market back when I worked on Wall Street. Second Market specialized in holding shares of companies that were not going public. And uh, they dealt with these illiquid securities. So Barry Silbert actually had more experience than most people to enter the Bitcoin space and to build something for Wall Street uh, within the Bitcoin space. Th that was literally his job uh, in things that were similar to Bitcoin, but wasn't Bitcoin before Bitcoin existed. And these companies do follow regulation and they have lawyers and they have like whole departments, compliance departments to make sure shit like FTF doesn't, uh, FTX doesn't happen. Now, yes, some fall through the cracks, 
like Bernie Madoff's funds, right, fall through the cracks. But pe- people have to realize that, uh, you know, a thing like Bernie Madoff funds, I mean, that was literally one in a thousand cases on Wall Street. One in a thousand. Meanwhile, FTX is not one in a thousand. That's like one in eight. Okay. So, yes, the similarity is there, but the percentage of it, the, the chances of it happening are insanely higher in the world of Bitcoin than it is on, Trish, uh, on, on Wall Street. So, uh, are they sharing their public keys? Uh, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the regula- if the regulation is asking them to, right? Like, I'm pretty sure. The SEC knows the public key of Coinbase's, you know, storage for companies. Uh, I'm sure they have these private discussions, but I'm just guessing, right? Like, I don't know what kind of regulation goes on behind the scenes because I'm not that connected uh, into that industry. But Joe Colasari might know better. Well, uh, that's what I was about to say. So welcome, Joe. Uh, We were getting in your domain. Uh, So the discussion here was a question that came through. Uh, one of our listeners asking, will the ETFs disclose their public keys? I'm re- paraphrasing it. And also, is there a way uh, to check whether they're printing like paper money, they're printing paper Bitcoin as well? Yeah, thanks for having me up. Hope everyone had a good holiday. Um, so I guess I would answer it this way. When you start off with the, the filing statements based on the data we have so far, it does not appear there's any uh, requirement within their effective prospectus to disclose the private keys. They could do so voluntarily. They probably should do so. And as I've said publicly for some time, if you want to become, you know, the, the quote unquote Bitcoiners ETF of the eight that will launch whenever they come to market, you will probably have some competitive advantage by being as transparent um, and open as possible. In other words, you know, if you're competing for market share amongst, you know, seven other entities, your seven other rivals, it would make sense that you have a talking point out there that you are disclosing and being transparent about the actual Bitcoin you hold. Um, and I would encourage a company to do that just because you want that sound bite, you want that talking point to go out and have people to say, no, 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 don't buy this ETF, buy this one. So I expect that to happen sort of organically, but there's nothing in any of the filings that would indicate that they would be required to disclose it. However, and this is a big however, um, and and this came up, I think, several months back when people were, you know, without any basis claiming that the GBTC didn't have all the Bitcoin it purported to have. For that to happen, you not only have to have one, but two, probably three or four, actually, at least two, um, to my knowledge, law firms and at least two major accounting firms to have to effectively be duped and in a grand conspiracy to just make up about, uh, your holdings and not have any backing for them. In other words, when, when these things come to market, the process is there's many different uh, boxes that need to be checked and sparing you all the details. You have independent outside people, separate from the company, you know, firms that are engaged that aren't going to put their entire license and, and reputation on the line by you know signing off on that because you know people brought up these these big scandals that occurred out there uh you know enron arthur anderson these types of things bernie made up bernie made up, you know lawyers they all were disbarred um some of the accounting firms that were behind them similar you know like they there's multiple you know uh silk stocking firms that would effectively be embroiled in a huge scandal if they were to sign off on some of the paper submissions and uh, just be a giant you know fabrication so i I rate that as being extremely unlikely. However, you know, to the larger point, I don't think there's anything that's going to, you know, ensure at this point when these products come to market, which I still expect them to in in the middle, uh, early to middle part of next year, um, that they were just going to be open and transparent about what they hold. Just a follow up question on this. Uh, So uh, that's understandable. But from the perspective of uh, the SEC and other uh, parties that are involved right now, shouldn't there be, uh, since Bitcoin is more of a peer-to-peer, you know, transaction-based system, shouldn't there be a public, uh, you know, visibility as well on this? Or that's not going to be part of any scrutiny uh, in from SEC's perspective? When you say that, shouldn't there be a public scrutiny? Uh, like, as in, like, the public should be aware of where the Bitcoin is being held, or the address at least. You mean how it's held? Like like what institution yeah. is holding it? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. That that we will know that the, the on chain data is what I was referring to. You will absolutely okay. be able to know that, just like we know that with with grayscale. Okay. That that that's that's what I wanted to ask. Okay. Now since you are here and we asked this question to Tone and he was not much aware about it. CZ, uh, I want to talk a little bit about it. We started this discussion before, but you're not. Uh, we did not have the education on that topic a, a lot. So what's really happening with Binance? In short, I'll ask the question, what's really happening with Binance? What's really happening with CZ? And will he be allowed to go back to Dubai or not? And on top of that, there was a news that uh, uh, DOJ will be pushing for 10 years in prison. Is that true? Yes. So, you know, we've, we've known some of this based on the plea agreement that was entered into, um, you know, days ago. There's an argument right now that's before the court as to whether he should be allowed to return. I mean, he obviously was released on his own recognizance, um, you know, after the hearing uh, last week. But the question is, as he's released pending sentencing, which isn't likely to happen until February, we have the date of that. Um, there's a question of where he has to reside. Is he going to reside in the United States? Is he have to, can he go back, uh, you know, overseas? And the government has effectively opposed his right to leave the country. Um, there are some questions whether they would or not, given that he voluntarily submitted himself uh, to U.S. jurisdiction. He didn't, you know, he appeared in a, in a federal courtroom, but he wasn't hauled in in handcuffs. His lawyers walked him in. Um, they actually, and this is a misconception just for people out there, before the press conference, right, there had already been a hearing earlier that morning, it was sealed, uh, where he was in front of a judge in federal court uh, in Washington, and he was effectively plea. So, you know, that all occurred before the news even break. I mean, I mean, the news was breaking sort of based on tips and rumors, but the hearing had already been conducted, I believe, as 11 o'clock uh, Pacific time, um, the day when, it, when the news broke. The point is that he he showed up there voluntarily. He he entered the United States voluntarily. wasn't extradited. wasn't arrested, and he pled. Uh, it was very well, you know, telegraphed and orchestrated on their side, and they knew exactly what was happening. The question is, you know, where does he go from here? The government did not oppose him being released because he appeared voluntarily, and they didn't have to go through the the trouble of extraditing him. The question is, uh, you know, w w there wasn't a agreement on, you know, could he leave the United States? So right now, where it stands. The, the judge is going to be able to decide whether or not he is allowed to leave the United States. Uh, the argument that the Binance folks are, and CZ is making is, why would I come all the way here, plea, leave, and then become a flight risk and not appear for my sentencing? That makes no sense. That would be uh, you know, something where, given that he's already pled a crime, wherever he would go to, he'd li likely be extradited anyway. Um, so that's, that's the Binance folks' argument. We'll see how the judge rules. I'm inclined to think that the judge does let him leave the United States. Um, that's just my my base case, but you know it's a 50-50 call. It could go either way. I don't feel very strongly either way. The reason is just because he's been so co cooperative, um, and you know it's going to be hard for the government to prove that he's you know real flight risk. But uh, aside from that, um, you know he will he will be sentenced. The government in a paper file, I believe yesterday, I was reading it this morning. Um, they actually argued that. He should get the full maximum threat threshold that there should be an upper adjustment to 10 years. Some folks were theorizing without much support that it could be, you know, 12 to 18 months. However, you know, that, that's like the minimum that he could serve. Uh, the question is, though, you know, how how aggressive is the judge going to be and how much of a message does the judge want to send? And sometimes it's better to know the actual judge in the circumstance rather than knowing the law because judges have different tendencies. So I have not, not yet done that sort of deep dive into his particular you know, district court judge that's been assigned. I will do that at some point, probably tomorrow when I have some time. But uh, I think you know, that's the, the large strokes, like what, 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 is, uh, you know, what is the sentence going to be? We'll know, we won't know until February. Um, sim similar to Binance, you know, Binance will get a sentence as well, whether they're going to go with the actual plea that's been entered. You know, they're requesting um, a, a particular type of, uh, um, you know, disgorgement, a particular type of penalty. But again, the judge has to sign off on it. The judge gets to sentence the Binance entity for its purported violation. The judge may adjust it down, he may adjust it up. He has sentencing guidelines he has to use, but there is some leeway he can and some discretion he can, he can uh, utilize. So hope that answers the question. Well, um, Joe, man, I, I actually still haven't listened to that space from the other day. I've just been super swamped with the conference coming up. 
uh, on the whole thing. Now, I must have missed something over because I was over at the financial summit conference. When the because okay, when the court when the case against Binance dropped, it wasn't uh, the Justice Department. It wasn't the criminal case. It was you know the financial side. It was the SEC. I think that came down no. on them. No, it's both. Oh, like we because we kept waiting for the real hammer from the Justice Department to drop with a criminal charge, but. Well, like, like that must have happened, and I totally missed it. Like, I didn't know this was. Uh, the, now, here's that what, was here's the... what happened. Let me give you the sequence. So earlier in the year, there were suits filed back to back within a day of one another by the SEC against Coinbase and Binance. Um, that one fell, I think, on like a Monday, and the other fell on a Tuesday. I can't remember. I think it was maybe June or, or maybe May. One of the one of those. And actually, a month or two before that, you had the CFTC file suit in the Northern District of Illinois by me against Binance. So you first had CFTC, then you had an SEC suit, and then there was this big question about where's DOJ? Where's DOJ? What's the deal with it? Right. And we now know what happened. Okay. What happened with DOJ is that they were ready to basically uh, issue an information, basically ready to seek charges against them. And they didn't because they were in uh, the process of trying to negotiate a plea. And they basically tip their hats to them saying, look, we're going to come get you. We're going to find you. We're going to charge you. You can come voluntarily. You can plead to this or we can negotiate something. And they elected for the latter. Now, if you remember, Tone, uh, I think we've talked about this. Like one of the strange things for people like me observing this is DOJ almost always goes first. The criminal always goes first and takes precedent over civil. So it was kind of a head scratcher. Right. Why did why did CFTC and SEC file? Well, if you remember, and this is you can go check the reporting. There was a public Bloomberg report about this back last January, um, January of uh, divided over whether the pull charges that there was some dissent about you know what actually would be sought in terms of the charges. My view of that is largely they could have pursued potentially other charges. Um, but they elected not to, and rather they wanted to take the easy victory, not that it was easy, but you know what I mean, the, the easier victory um, to effectively get the, the money laundering and the Bank Secrecy Act violations and the, you know, the, the international statutes that prevent transfers to Iran, those sort of easier convictions. And Binance didn't really have a defense, so they just basically rolled over on those. So that's why SEC was given the green light to go ahead and file when they did because the DOJ said this will most likely result in some type of a plea. They're probably already, you know, a few months away from getting something firmed up and, and done on that front. Um, but in any event, it. It, doesn't really, it doesn't really matter because what, what we saw from the criminal side is that this was actually filed, the information, which is basically the formal way of bringing a charge without an indictment. The government doesn't have to unpanel a grand jury to, to have an information. Um, that was actually filed back on November 14th. And if you look on the electronic docket of the court, they sealed the filing. So they clearly did not want the public to know that this filing was, in fact, made. And the reason for that, which is stated in the docket, was that they did not want to disrupt the marketplace. So the DOJ, and they actually said this when they sought a protective order as well. Right. They, 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 November, 14 of, November 14 of this year. Correct. Yes. Just want to make it back. Okay. They, they filed this. And they immediately filed a motion to seal. And the basis for that is that there could be irreparable harm and injury to the marketplace and market participants. I mean, imagine if you just randomly without any sort of notice, um, you know, there is a, you know, Binance indicted and, you know, CZ is on, they're on the hunt for CZ and he's out of the country. So what they did is when they sealed it, they gave him an opportunity basically to voluntarily comply. He probably had, you know, rather than him being hauled out in handcuffs, he probably had time to wind down some of his operations at Binance, um, you know, you know, sign off his, his accounts, do whatever he needed to do, um, and said, we need you to be in a federal courthouse when's the earliest you can be here. And they agreed upon a date, and there we have it. Okay, so this answers our biggest question at the time. Why the hell didn't the DOJ file because those SEC and CFTC charges were, like, really criminal? Uh, as part of those, uh, you know, uh, on those dockets, hundred percent. It was really confusing, and that—that's 
what we knew, what we know now is that all that was happening was fine and said, yeah, we'll plead to something. But keep in mind, like you, you negotiate this stuff for months. You negotiate every single aspect. I mean, they had a negotiation that uh, you can go read the documents. I mean, there's a 15 page negotiation about the monitor, the monitor that's in there and uh, which we can talk about. But, you know, basically an independent person who's going into the company is going to have to have total oversight over the books and records and every wire, every transfer, every account, every every key. They can every communication from a customer. Every, they can have access to any uh, employees without anyone listening, basically, to have an interview. Um, you know, they have they had a ton of discretion. Oh. Yeah. yeah. OK, so, Joe, so so what happens now? Right. So so here's the here's the thing. OK, so he shows up in America and pleads guilty. Now, it's, it is a, a bit similar to what Arthur Hay did. You know, he came back, he went to Hawaii, uh, he came back. But the difference is Arthur Hay was a U.S. citizen. And CZ is not a U.S. citizen. Now, I don't understand why CZ, I, I don't get it, why CZ came to American soil and now he's begging to be able to leave. And if they're hanging a 10-year prison sentence on his head. Like, hell, if I was him, I wouldn't come back for that sentencing, if that sentencing can be years. And I'm not sure, I mean, maybe CZ tried to get China to help him and protect him and, like, in America on this front, uh, but maybe China didn't want to deal with it, uh, or he feels that China may not protect him. But I don't see why China wouldn't protect him. I mean, look what Putin did. I mean, Putin exchanged um, a basketball player for uh, for that guy from the movie Lord of uh, Lord of War. What was it? Uh, you know, the Nicholas, the one that Nicolas Cage played, right? And it wasn't even because like Putin really wanted that guy. It was because Russia arrested a Russian citizen who uh, like in Thailand and was sent it was being sentenced in america and it was basically causing embarrassment i'm like no i does not have the right to just arrest our citizens uh and uh, grab them in other countries bring them back and keep them there so that's why he kind of asked for him back right so again this it, it, it's it's kind of weird like like again it makes sense why arthur hay came back and arthur hay probably had a lot more guarantees before he came back, he only served house arrest for like six months, which was great. I'm very happy for him, by the way. And uh, but with CZ, it's like, man, these prosecutors, they're just like relentless assholes. No offense to your profession that they're not even considering the fact that he didn't have to come back. He could have literally created an international incident. He could have just stayed in China. He could have literally kept doing what he's doing, and there was nothing the U.S. could have done about this. And they're still trying to put him away for ten years. That's kind of messed up. Yeah, um, I will say this: I I think that the government had the opportunity to be more aggressive against him, and potentially more aggressive against finance as an entity and other individuals at finance. And to me, that was definitely a card they were willing to play. Keep in mind, they they had so much information. I've talked to some people very close to this, okay? They had thousands upon thousands of signal messages, okay, from his phone. They probably had him dead, dead to say, like, yes, I agree with your point. Like, you can always run, right? But that's not necessarily a great way to live. Um, and that's not necessarily one that ever ensures your freedom, when you start running. And um, and again, with respect to the, the Chinese government, I would question or at least push back on how much of support he had internally within in the Chinese government. Um, to me, I, I think that's a real sort of dubious uh, uh, assumption that he would not be willing to uh, support him because obviously Binance was a, uh, I mean, it's documented, this is in my opinion, that they've, they've laundered significant amounts of Chinese money um, out of the country. So, uh, you know, aside from that, um, I mean, that's why China hates Bitcoin to begin with, right? It has nothing to do with, uh, it, it's primarily driven by capital flight. They don't want money, money leaving the country. And that's why they, they did the mining ban. And that's why they've done a whole host of things to try to clamp down on banning Bitcoin and unbanning it and banning it again. Um, I think that's like a huge factor. They, they don't like the money leaving the country. Um, but the larger point is, 
the, they, the government could have been far more aggressive. The government could have probably brought other charges. And this was probably negotiated that these are going to be charges. That's it. No further charges. And anything else that we discover, once we get our monitor in there, we can no longer charge anyone else. Um, so, you know, they, they have given up some ability. For example, you know, we won't get, somebody asked, where does it go from here? We won't get the monitor in there realistically until probably March, okay, at the earliest. Um, and that's when you'll finally understand, you know, are there any bodies buried here? We have some independent eyes on it. Um, and if the monitor doesn't under, uh, you know, identify, you know, non-tax fraud that's there, arguably that would no longer be subject to prosecution. So that's like a big deal too, right? That would be, you know, some pressure on other people around CZ to say, hey, you got to, you got to move on this one because it, we're the whole operations at risk. So what do you think is realistic for CZ? Do like three years in uh, one of yeah, those camps? Like Charlie Trump? He won't serve 10 years. Absolutely not. With the, with, you know, the, one of the single biggest things judges look at is how cooperative you are. This is why I said, you know, and, and may I call on me, I was totally wrong. I thought for sure. OK, and, 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 I, and I'll, I'll take the blame for it. I thought for sure SBF would plead. I think that case made no sense for him to do it. Only his ego or delusion is what drove him. But I mean, they had the entire upper brass at FTX testifying against Sam there and his lawyers had no defense. I mean, it, it, I know that lawyers can't, you know, they can only deal with the facts they're given, but there was no defense. I mean, it was basically this, you know, confusing, you know, uh, oh, he's just a loser. Did, did, no, did SPF get a sentence? I must have missed that as well. No, no, no. He, he got, but he got convicted. He got right, convicted. but the sentencing hasn't happened yet. Correct. But if, but what I was saying is the reason I brought up SPF is that one of the single biggest things judges look at is if you were willing to accept responsibility and plea. Okay. If you're willing to forego a trial and just say, I was wrong, I admit it, it saves the court time, it saves, you know, resources. Uh, it is something the judges looked at as like an act of contrition where you're basically saying I screwed up and they factor that in sentencing. So put it this way. If you commit a crime, OK, and you have an option of going through the process of a trial where it's 90 percent chance you're going to be found guilty or you could plea and you're going to get a substantially reduced sentence. What's the bargain there? Why would you want to go through and in, 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 from an expected value type standpoint, why would you want to go through and in, in, and, and bet against, uh, you know, the, the favorable odds to try to sit and see if you can get some sort of hung jury or something like that. Or would you just accept your fate and take a reduced sentence? To me, it's a no brainer. That's why most cases plea out because it's, you know, most cases aren't, you know, some difficult case where there's a lot of evidence that's exculpatory and, and shows that you're innocent or shows, shows that there's reasonable doubt. Most cases plea because there's overwhelming evidence on behalf of the government. Okay, gotcha. So, so um, my point is that my point is like he did the right, like uh, CZ did the smart thing, like he accepted responsibility and pled, and that will be factored by the court. Now, the court's also going to factor like how much money was laundered, what what the effect of the crimes were, what his knowledge was. Um, you know, they're going to factor a whole whole host of different uh, aspects in the sentencing guidelines. And when they do that, you know, he's put himself in a position being cooperative that is basically going to maximize his opportunity to get out and get on with his life um, at some point. Whereas SBF did the exact opposite. Um, he, he, you know, he, he basically had no plea deal um, offered by the government. He had no cards to play. He had everyone testify against him. He went through a whole trial and then, you know, the jury returned it and like uh, returned his, the verdict in I think two hours, you know, it was, it was a slam dunk. Yeah. Can, can we also get back to the SBF case for a second? So what happens to those that, like basically testified against them, like Caroline, is she going to be potentially facing prison time or she gets off clean free? I don't know the specifics of whatever deal she struck. There might hit there. Might, I know she did strike a deal of some kind. Um, so I have to look into that and it should be public at this point. But, you know, all of them, because of their cooperation, because of their willingness to come forward and testify, the government is basically going to, I think, uh, request the the most lenient sentence possible for whatever they've been charged with. So that's just the way to, to look at it. Most of them will get off with very little, if any, time served. Okay, got it. 
All right. So when do you think, what are the sentencings on, on these things, right? Like both SPL, that's taking a while, right? Shouldn't he be sentenced by now? Yeah, give me one second. I'll give you the SBF date. I did look at the Binance date, so Binance sentencing will be February 25th. Shit, that's a while. Yep. Already know the trade that you need to take on the Binance on Feb 25th. <laughs> well, well, till the time Joe is finding it out. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, you have a question? Well, we have Bitcoin with March, us. So that's... Sorry, March, uh, March 28th is going to be the sentencing for SBF. March 12th, holy shit. Wow, how funny would it be if it's the day of the having? <laughs> yeah, that would be funny. Uh, Bitcoin, you have a question you wanna ask? You there? If you are trying to speak, you're muted. I guess he's not here anymore. Well, all right, guys. I, I, I do, I do have to start wrapping up. Uh, I mean, you guys can stay on, Joe, if you want to stay on. Uh, but I will have no, to I get going to out the top of the hour. I, I was about to say that I am out of topics as well for today, and uh, it was great having you uh, back, uh, Joe. Uh, I was, I sent you an invite as and when we started. I think you were busy uh, at that time, but thanks for joining in. Thanks for shedding light on the topics that we basically could not answer at the point we were discussing. It's always great to have you. Uh, any closing thoughts, Tone, uh, before we wrap this up? Uh, no, other than, look, Bitcoin is uh, pulling back a little bit. It's still consolidating. Uh, I mean, uh, you got to stay bullish. I mean, I've been waiting for this elusive pullback that's just not happening. And uh, today's Sunday. Let's see how the stock market trades. Still bullish the stock market. I'm now more bullish on oil. Then in weeks past, because we are hitting an MRI buy opportunity, uh, I think gold is looking nicely for a near-term breakout. And uh, I am off to Nor uh, no, South Carolina tomorrow for a Future of Mining event uh, down there. There will be a live stream. I will be doing some interviews down there. And uh, don't forget, Unconfiscatable, just 10 days away. we got the poker tournament coming up on Wednesday uh, the 6th. Conference is Thursday, Friday, followed by a bunch of fun activities on uh, on Saturday. Usually go bowling, some axe throwing. It's a lot of fun. I'm expecting Joe Colasari to be possibly on two panels, on the economic panel and on the legal panel. Uh, it'll be a really, really fun time. I see DR Little John. Uh, I'll see you there. Brian, unfortunately, uh, you can't make it this time. Uh, run, right, fly. You were there last year. I remember you. Hopefully you can come back. Motorist will be there. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people in the audience uh, that will be a part of it. Uh, so looking forward to seeing you guys there. Perfect. Uh, well, that that was a great space. And uh, have a safe journey, Tone. I'll see you next week then. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you so much.